Uh, pipe down, please, Daisies. Enough gossip. <laughs> we have a, a seek riot in the corner here. Please. So, guys, um, today we have two extraordinary stories in one. Um, we're going to be talking about the history of Sikh art and its journey from a, a, a religion that was initially fairly suspicious of images uh, to one that has embraced many of the greatest artists of South Asia uh, and produced many of the great masterpieces of South Asian art. Uh, we're going to be doing this through the personal journey and collection of Davinda here, um, which is in itself an extraordinary story. Uh, what year was the Sikh exhibition? Uh, last year. No, 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 no,
There's one in a Janam Sakhi, which is you know, the life stories of the gurus in, in a private collection in Delhi from the mid 1600s, which is almost like a century after the guru's death. And, um, and a, a great deal of time after Guru Nanak's death. Yeah, yeah. a century, <coughs> yes, exactly. So 1539 uh, was his date of passing. So you've got that, but you've also got a, a really fantastic collection um, in Dehradun with Baba Ram Rai, who was one of the sort of outcast sons of the seventh guru that we see here in this wonderful artwork, who have resettled after a patronage given by Aurangzeb um, in, in the Dune Valley. And uh, he was a patron of the arts. But more importantly, he, was, he inherited, the first son always inherited the property. So he was um, uh, the older branch of a family. And they basically had a collection of paintings. And we think that amongst those paintings are the earliest paintings of the Sikh gurus, <coughs> um, of Guru Har Gobind, his grandfather, and of Guru Nanak. In case people can't see this wonderful image, you just describe it to us. Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a painting of uh, the seventh Sikh Guru, Guru Har Rai, holding a flower with an attendant um, uh, on the side there. It's, we believe it's from the, the workshop of the, the family of Nansuk, very famous Galera artist that B.M. Goswami and others like William have written extensively about. And they, they've got this incredible... Uh, yeah, the Mughal, it's the, it's the combination of Mughal art and uh, Rajput art. You've got the wonderful accuracy of the naturalistic aspects of Mughal art, fantastic portraiture alongside vibrant colours and sort of wildlife of the Rajput system. What you, what you find with, with this particular portrait, what is quite interesting when we talk about the, when we talk about the Sikh gurus and you talk about you know, the iconoclast and everything, is in these early, what we consider to be earlier portraits within the Sikh tradition, is um, you see, for example, here you have a guru without a halo. You know, there's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more subtle in earlier kind of Sikh art. You still have this sign of his divinity when you see the whole scene and his kind of calmness and sereneness, yet uh, not a lot of emphasis is put on... So that, what is this, about 1730s, 1740s? No, this would probably be in the later parts of the 1800s, so in the 18th century, about 1790, around then. So this is first so generation after two, Nansuk. More than 200 years after the death. Of the first. That's right, more than yeah. 200 years after. And, and we, you know, we talked about the Sikh, you know, we talked about miniatures being mainly a part of this princely, princely tradition. Is to think, we need to think about who, is, who are these being made for and who is viewing them. Um, so this is um, you know, from the family of Nensu from Galer. And we know when we see images from Galer and from Gangra, you, there's certain portraits that you see where it shows the Rajas holding portraits and looking at them and passing them around. And, you know, so it would have been quite an intimate thing. You know, not everybody would have had access to fine portraits like this. And this is one of the great sort of lucky flukes of the story of Sikhart, that one of the first territories taken over by, by the Sikh empire and, and by, uh, and by uh, Ranjit Singh's uh, empire was this area uh, in the Punjab hills where there had been this extraordinary efflorescence of, of painting, where um, particularly painters who had lost work in the mm. Mughal court yeah. uh, with Aurangzeb bringing back iconoclasm, migrate to the hills or migrate home to the hills. That's right. And this area where these extraordinary experiments are taking place with some of the most spectacular miniature paintings ever painted in India happened to enter very early into, yeah. in, into Sikh uh, uh, control. So much of Sikh art that has survived and that we see today either in museums or collections, um, we know has much of it came about during the reign of Ranjit Singh, you know, which is a period of about sort of 40 to 50 years. This, however, and this is featured earlier in the book because it starts off earlier, is, is, is actually it's painted when he's about 10 years old. So this is looking at um, a time in the Punjab where in the Punjab hills, which he hasn't yet conquered, right. these are Sikh miniatures being produced then. So this is pre his kind of reign, really, which makes it even more fascinating. We know that when he um, does venture into the hills, he, um, you know, the, the patronage is still provided to the kings and he doesn't actually formally take hold of Gangra um, until about the 1820s, the late 1820s, but we know that there's Sikh miniatures being produced before that. And these, just to clarify, so the painters are at this point Hindu, Hindu painters who've previously been painting for uh, images particularly of the Bhagavad Puran, uh, of um, <coughs> Uh, of, of Govind Gita, Govind Gita. Govind Gita. Yeah. so a mixture of, of yeah. specifically Hindu um, images and uh, general uh, Punjabi and other 
um, uh, 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 devotional works. That's right. Uh, and now suddenly, under Sikh rule, the, 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 the nature of these commissions is changing, and they're now painting for the first time images of, 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 the, of, the, of the gurus. And That's right. And, the, and you, you find, uh, with the images that survive from that early period, that these are devotional works of art, these are um, also historic documents. In many ways, it's local people documenting what's happening at the time. And they give us wonderful insight. Uh, I think if we go... And these, these, are, these are actual portrait paintings. I mean, the, 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 the Goulet tradition is to sit in front of somebody mm. and, and paint someone um, you know, a likeness. And yet, in this one, they're doing something who's died, someone who's died 100 years earlier. That's right. So it's, it's right. A, it possibly an imaginary image? Or? Yeah, it's, no. an, it's an imagined scene. You can only assume that it may have been copied or partly influenced by an earlier portrait. And as Banjit said, there are yeah. earlier portraits that we know to exist. There aren't, you know, it's, it's hard to find a contemporary portrait of Guru Nanak, but there are contemporary portraits, if you look from the sixth guru onwards, uh -huh. uh, there are contemporary portraits of those gurus that exist very much in the Mughal or Deccani tradition. Um, I was going to say about this, also what we find with um, this portrait and the next is is just the, the, the kind of the accuracy at the time, the accuracy in terms of, uh, you know, I, I don't just collect miniatures, but also arms and armor and textiles. Um, it provides an insight when you start looking at all the other objects and artifacts alongside it. You really get an, an idea of what life was so like. So again, does, for those who can't see this image, and apologies for the, for the poor projection, what, is the, what, are, what are we looking at here? So this is the, this is the um, this is Guru Hare Krishna, the son of the previous guru that you saw, the young boy king. That's exquisite. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's very, very fine. Also by the, from the same school, um, first generation after, after Nansuk in uh, Guler. And um, it's, it's William Archer from the V&A uh, published these uh, paintings in his famous book, uh, Paintings of the Sikhs. Um, and it's, it's excessively rare to find uh, paintings from that early early period. When, I'm t when I mean early, I mean you know from when Ranjit Singh was, was young. So much of what survived is from later on. Sh uh, sorry, can I make a point on this? We yeah. have to remember that Ranjit Singh is a third generation Sikh king. So you've got his grandfather's generation uh, operating in Punjab, fighting back you know Afghan domination in the mid 1700s, and they're they're spreading from the plains up into the hills as you say, and they're the ones who are commissioning works. So it's Jasin Kaniya, Jasa Singh Ram Gariya, Jasa Singh Alawali, these guys who are becoming the new, you know, they're occupying yeah. the, the divans and the, the courtly uh, scenarios that of, the, of the defeated uh, hill states. Okay. Um, this is actually part of a series of portraits of the gurus. Um, several came up in, with Dravinda required these two, a few others have dispersed to private collectors, lucky them. Um, but there are a few also, I think, uh, I think they go back to Guru Nanak all the way through to the Guru's <coughs> That's right, they? yeah. Archer the, published them all in his 1966 right. book. The, the idea here with, uh, with putting these towards the kind of front, the, the early part of the book, was to, to guide the reader through Sikh history, through the rise and fall of the Sikh empire, through objects, through artifacts, and also to kind of just highlight certain areas as if you were, you know, if, if one of us was giving you a guided tour, how would we do that? In the text is how would we instruct you, not instruct you, but how kind of guide you where to look, where we might be looking, and kind of the, atten the attentions, uh, the, the details kind of that needs to be um, considered. And um, those paintings, just to go back one step, Brandon, you mentioned, it's really important to understand this, that in the 1700s, the Sikhs are, are fighting for survival. So they're, they're not, they haven't established themselves. They're ruling the Punjab by these 12 confederacies. Uh, much of the time they're fighting between each other uh, and then they every now and then get together to fight a, a common enemy. And maybe we should just give the, the, kind of the, the, the mega picture. So the Mughal Empire has shattered. Um, uh, Nadir Shah, the Persian conqueror, has come and gone, taken away the entire treasury of the Mughals. So there's nothing left to pay the Mughal troops anymore. So the, uh, every, the empire is fragmented like a mirror thrown out of a first floor window. Hundreds of different little fragmented states where once this enormous empire yeah. was. And the new power, the new power which everyone is frightened of is not the Mughals, but, uh, nor yet the Sikhs, but the, uh, the, the Afghans. And the, uh, the Ahmed Shah Abdali, who, who, who becomes the first king of Afghanistan as Ahmed Shah Durrani, the Pearl of Pearls, uh, is this sort of incredibly fearsome um, Afghan warlord who conquers all of modern Afghanistan, creates the modern Afghan state, conquers quite a, a, a chunk of Khorasan in Persia, 
uh, and a bit of Central Asia, and then comes on annual raids down to try and loot Delhi. Delhi then, you know, super rich, um, mega city full of gold and artworks, despite the fact that Nadir Shah has already cleared out some of the best stuff. Mm. Mm. Uh, and uh, he makes, I think, 17 annual raids to Delhi, loots Matra, loots Vrindavan, burns the temples there. And of course, the first place that gets the attention of Amishab Abdali on each of these is the Punjab. Yeah, on the way there and uh, on the way on back. The way, yeah, <laughs> and each time, and, and the, the Golden Temple gets burnt down on a number of occasions. That's right. uh, and it's all pretty bloody and unpleasant. But out of this bloodshed comes this kind of, you know, guerrilla force. That's right. Um, who form these missiles. These, 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 these and they, and they, and they, and they no. fill they fill this vacuum. If you go to the next slide, um, I think maybe we skip this one for a second. It's nice, lovely. lovely but, but, but maybe we'll come, come, back to come back to that. Just in terms of the narrative and the story. Um, so we look at like, those missiles, those confederacies that then spread out and they start to take portions of the Punjab. Imagine it as this vacuum that suddenly they need to fill. You know, it's. Um, um, Persians and Afghans on one side, Mughals on the other, and every now and then, after the Afghans and the Persians have gone back, the Punjab is left in these Sikh... And we shouldn't those. forget the Marathas, too. That's right. So the Marathas are also fighting for this. So to add to the chaos, on top of the Afghans coming down, the Sikhs doing their own thing around, around the Punjab, you've got the Marathas coming up from Pune, um, very, I mean, a peasant army like the Sikh army, um, full of incredibly um, sort of lightly armed, uh, plundering... Um, farmers who often go back and will till their fields in the, in, in the winter. And these guys are also after the loot of Delhi. So this whole area is a totally mm -hmm. anarchic. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the background to, to, out of which this, this yeah. art is coming. And, and many Sikhs, we don't often tend to look too much. You know, we're, either we're fascinated by Maharaja Ranjit Singh and the court of Lahore and its kind of glory. We know a little bit about the, the, the Guru period. But there's this period in between. This, uh, this time when you know, the Sikhs are really fighting for survival that is, is seldom sort of written about and seldom known in terms of art. When this painting turned up in London, it was very, very intriguing and you could, you could dismiss it when you first saw it. And, um, but it was very intriguing because it had these scantily clad Sikh warriors, um, what it seems to be kind of sitting, sitting in court and watching a group of uh, dancing girls or... Um, um, Yes, enjoying some entertainment. Now, in the, in the margin of the painting, it says in Persian, it says, Gorbin Singh Singh, which means these are the, these are the Sikhs, these are the Sings of Gorbin Singh, Singh, and it gives us an idea as to who they, who they are. It was misidentified. And, what, and what's, with the, what's with the kind of bikinis they're wearing? What's well, 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 this is interesting because yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, so these are... This is, this is a painting which dates Monokinis, from... Monokinis, are they? A painting which dates from the late 1700s. It's from the Awad or Lucknow School of Painting, so it's not from the Punjabi School of Painting, it's not from the Punjab Hills, as many of the other portraits that we see are. And you kind of wonder, well, why is it being painted there? And why are these men being shown in this way? When it was first sold, it was sold as Guru Gobind Singh and his four sons. They had misread and misidentified the inscription in the margin. Now, we know that they couldn't be his four sons because two of his sons died very young, and we have three very long beards uh, with four of them there. But it did say Gorbin Singh Singh, and that's what misled them. But it says these are the Sikhs, the Sings of Gorbin Singh. It's in that Awad Lucknow School of Painting. That, that style is very distinctive. And there was a, um, a Swiss mercenary uh, called um, Polia, who um, was employed by the Nawab of uh, Lucknow. Um, and uh, he wrote about the Sikhs in the 1700s. And it's... it's just fascinating to read his account because he almost describes those Sikhs identically, just as you would see them in that picture. And he talks about how they don't wear very much. They've recently come into wealth. They've got these almost kind of tartan kind of robes. He talks about their kind of checkered clothes and how they just wear these warrior breeches and their simple blue turbans. And he, and he talks about gold quoits in their turbans and gold bracelets around their wrists. And what we see here in this portrait, which some Sikhs may well find offensive is the early Sikhs, the early Sikh kings, in kind of in, either in enjoying the trappings of, of kingship. They've got a little glass of something in their they've hand. They've got a glass of something, we, don't, we yeah. don't know what. They've also got some fruit. The full yeah. bagpiper, whatever. That's right. <laughs> um, but we, we know that, for example, they, they were filling those vacuums. They were kind of emulating the kings that were there before them. They were taking over those empty palaces, old forts, and then 
you know, if you imagine that they've just come out of fighting for survival and suddenly they're now enjoying these trappings and this is 10 to 15 years before Ranjit Singh. And these, these were Afghan, emerges. these were dancing girls who might have been, edu uh, might have been um, entertaining the Afghans only a few years earlier they, or the Mughals. Or, uh, they yeah. may, may well have been and, and, and we, and there are two other portraits, are there other? Yep. So how do, how do we know this, so for example? So if we, do you want to talk about these other next two paintings? Well, Quick word about Polier. Polier is, is one of the, again, one of these fascinating characters who emerges at this period. He's Swiss. Uh, he comes and works initially for the East India Company. He helps build Fort William in Calcutta. And then he wants a bit more adventure, so he goes inland, works for the Nawabs of Avad, and eventually for Shah Alam uh, in Delhi. And all this time, he's commissioning uh, miniature paintings. And he writes these very peremptory letters to the painters. Today we talk of Nain Sook and these great masters as, as sort of high figures like Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael. But uh, Polly is writing to them as if he's writing to a carpenter. Mm. So they want 10 by next week uh, and, uh, and make sure they're here get, uh, properly bound. And, uh, that's the kind of tone he's, he's taking. And um, he has a lovely time in Lucknow, has all these dancing girls, it all looks very nice. And then he makes one of the great errors of history. He goes back and buys a chateau in France in 1788, uh, which those of you that know your history, well, there's one year before the French Revolution, and he ends up in the guillotine the next year. So that's the end of Polly. So. <laughs> <laughs> there's um, two, two things that come up with that which are quite interesting. One is we get more of an understanding as to why many Indian artists don't sign their paintings. They're not considered in the same way that we would consider European artists. They are kind of lower down the tree in terms of kind of artisans. Every now and then, one of them will sneak his own portrait into a picture, and then you'll get to find out who he, what he looked like, who he was. But very, it's very rare that you find a, yeah. a signature on an Indian miniature. Um, why you have to be quite a master to get away with that. Yeah. It's considered yeah. an act of folie de grandeur. Or, yeah. why, why does Polier, why would he commission that? Portrait in the first place. You know, these are this is this is a power that needs to be watched. You know, the, the Punjab is you know neighbouring territory. Who are these people in the Punjab? What do they do? You know, how, who are these new kings that are emerging? The, the, and the Sikhs at this point just now we're now what's uh, time of Shah Alam so 17, 1772 he comes back to Delhi. By a decade later, the Sikhs are raiding the suburbs of Delhi, mm. uh, and mm. you get uh, so Polly is sitting in Delhi. These are the guys who might be raiding his Absolutely. own picture collection Absolutely. next year. Well, the the, the yeah. fascinating thing about Pali is he also commissioned a work on the Hindu divinities. <coughs> so all the Devi Devdas and so on. And at the end of that album, there's actually a painting of Guru Nanak with his companion Pai Madanna. Really? And that album is in the collection of the British Library. And if you trace back the history of the album and its provenance, you realise that that was probably the first uh, item of Sikh art that was sold in auction in, in the UK. Mm back in 1818. Mm. The, other, the other fascinating story about that painting, can we go back to the, the portrait mm -hmm. a second, just to the, um, the scene. The other really fascinating thing about this painting is that you know, you've got this um, unusual depiction, of, you know, these, these Sikhs with long beards watching some courtesans and some dancing girls. You know, what's going on here? And it's, you know, it's quite a controversial scene. Um, around that time, there's also, there was a manuscript that was written called the Brim Sumarag which um, was a, a manuscript mainly kind of um, directed towards these early Sikh kings. And in there, you know, there's instructions to say to these Sikh kings, well, you know, you're now about to get, you know, come into power. Um, with regards to the courtesans, don't discard them. Don't throw them out of the courts. They are highly skilled dancers, musicians, singers. Employ them, bring them in. And it says to them, you know, if you don't, if, if not to employ them as dancers, you know, get them to sing the Guru Shabbat, get them to sing the holy hymns from the Granth. You know, so there's instructions to them. Also, the courtesans had uh, a really valuable role within the court. Many of them were trained assassins. Many of them were employed by Which the Maharaja. Which is something that goes right back to Kartilya. That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and many of them were employed. We know that Maharaja Ranjit Singh, for example, you know, known as the Amazon, they were his personal bodyguards. Just... 30 years, 20 years before this, the son of Mir Jaffa, who betrayed the, uh, the, the, the uh, if you like, lost Plassey, was one of the great sort of um, uh, horror figures of Indian history, because mm. he, he, he betrayed his master, uh, Siraj Adawla, uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to Robert Clive. And his son, Miran, uh, is killed shortly afterwards in uh, what is very variously described as a lightning strike. Um, but the, the, there's very early on, you get the theory floated that one of the uh, dancing girls had murdered him because she had he had murdered her sister. Mm. 
mm. who had been with Siraj Dalla, mm. uh, and then burnt the tent down to hide the evidence. So th mm. this idea that dancing girls were assassins is a very common idea. Yeah, and you, and you can find and you can find miniatures. Yeah. You can find uh, in the Punjab School of Painting. You can find portraits of these dancing girls with daggers, swords, yeah. weapons. You know, yet holding a very feminine. So, the, so being afraid of Sherni Punjabi women is no, nothing new. <laughs> <laughs> so <kind of laughs> okay. So, so this, this portrait, this is actually in the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. It's just to use, you know, how you try to date and place a work of art. You look around and try and find similar works of art, right? It's the simplest thing you can do. So you've got this painting, which is catalogued as being Shah Jahan attending the wedding of his son. I'm not sure if that's the correct attribution. But if you look at the painting style, it's exactly the same, and they've also placed it in terms of the same place and location, and probably the same patron Often as the against early moonlit painting. sky. Moonlit sky. Well, that yeah. one's actually got a moon in there. Yeah, there's a moon in this one, but not in the the, the your one. Um, but the pavilion, everything, the terrace, the the, the cups, the utensils, the crockery, everything's the same. Mm. And it's also this is this is a painting of Surya Dalla uh, enjoying dancing girls, and you, if you look, they're exactly the same set of dancing girls <laughs> in Davinda's really portrait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can place it with quite a lot of confidence at that time and the polio connection, how he describes the Sikhs at the time. It's a, almost an identical match and you, you kind of think, well, polio has got his hand behind this, not as the artist, but as the patron in this instance. So that's a really um, fantastic sort of set of, bit of investigation that had to be done. I'm just conscious of the time done. slightly. Um, we've got, we've we've got another, few, another 30 minutes. Yeah, minutes. yeah, okay, we've got quite a few slides okay. to get Yeah, to lots, get lots to get yeah. through. Um, I'll just open on this one. Uh, Davinda's... Uh, Portrait on the left. Well, not my owns. portrait. <laughs> not of Davinda. <laughs> so, Imagine the uh, profile. No, this is a portrait of a one of those Sikh uh, Confederacy leaders called Vazir Singh, who headed a, uh, was part of one of the leading lights in a, one of the Confederacies called the Nagai Missile. And it's a it's a very light preparatory sketch. It's um, it's, it's used as a reference point for a larger work, and you'll see that in the next slide. This was, this was a great find, actually. This was, um, this was one of those, the few finds, you know, that really do kind of stir something. And this turned up um, misidentified in a small London auction house. And, um, and, you know, I often get asked the question, well, how do you detect these pictures when they come up? How do you know what's important and what's not? And, and there's no real quick way to do that, other than the fact that I tried to, to see as much as I could in my early days of uh, collecting and I had I'd kind of seen I'd seen images that you'll see in a moment that were in both the V&A and in uh, San Diego uh, of similar scenes so then when something turned up you can identify Foxy. and you might you might not know instantly but it kind of just makes you then go back into your books and look look up something. As a general point, just to talk quickly about your collecting, the, um, this is a field where often things turn up misidentified, that there aren't many actual scholars working on this field, that the guys in Sotheby's and Christie's and Bonham's don't actually know this field that well. And with a little knowledge, you, you've been able to build up a collection, often by picking up stuff which has been misidentified in, in auction catalogues and so on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's possible, and it's quite remarkable, really. I mean, you often, you know, you think in the collecting field, it's no, I, I grew up thinking, you know, the collections are just there, they're just formed. Museums are just there. And there isn't stuff out there that still needs to be bought. It's not possible to find it anymore. It must have been, it must have been done already. Um, but I had this kind of revelation. After that V&A exhibition, I then started to you know, visit Portobello Road and visit various dealers in Notting Hill and elsewhere and go to fairs. And quite quickly, I, I thought, hang on a second, like, I think the Sikh world is a little bit asleep, really. Yeah with regards to collecting. And actually, I think a world-class class collection can actually be formed now, okay. if only I kind yeah. of put my mind to it. And it was, it was that kind of, kind of got me going. Even more so a generation ago. I mean, we, those of us that collect today um, are, are continually aware that everything that we're paying relatively low sums for often was available for even less yeah. uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And that um, in the 1950s, you could buy nine silks by weight. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for, for a few hundred rupees, that uh, these great collections were being sold off, often by the Maharajas, mm. who in the early days of independent India wanted to stand for elections and were looking for things to flog off cheaply. Okay. Um, and, and you could buy a nine silk for a couple of quid in the, mm. in the 1950s. Mm. Uh, but even now, these things are by no means out of reach. And you can get a really good museum quality uh, 18th century miniature 
for four or five thousand pounds, well, you know, the equivalent in Italy uh, would be unimaginably out of reach and, uh, and, and, and so on. So these are things that people can actually uh, go out and buy. These are not, luckily yet, out of reach of ordinary people. No, no, I don't think so. Well, talking about museum quality, if you look at the portrait, so the, the, the left-hand portrait of Aziz Singh in Davinder's collection, the dual collection, it's actually got a small inscription that names him in Dev Nagu's script above his name. You can't see it in this crop, but it's there. So immediately, I think it rang bells in that the image on the right, which is of a very similar hand of three Sikh uh, chieftains, and they're all named, um, tells us that this is all part of one artist's portfolio. Um, and it's probably uh, Purku or um, somebody in his workshop, somebody in his atelier from family. Ganga. Yeah. From Ganga. From Purku of Ganga, one of the other, the other great parallel lines of art artistic tradition to the Nansuk family. Um, and the, the chaps on the right, that's in the V&A reserve collection. Um, the, the, the chap on the left, if you go left to right, that's, I think his name is, Lan uh, no, he's, uh, uh, I forget his name now. Anyway, Nahar Singh. Nice. The chap in the middle is Maha Singh, and the chap on the right, the elderly gentleman, is Lana Singh. Now, watch this. Have I got a pointer on this? No. We're, we're really working. We're totally working. Nobody can see this anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> this this, this uh, image is a crop from a work of art in the Boston Museum Boston. of Fine Art. It's a really um, damaged piece of canvas. It's, uh, the edges are really, uh, th th there's losses. The paper's kind of, uh, the paintwork's flaking away in much of it. But there's enough of it left for you to make out that this is a meeting of two confederacies. Um, and, and the brilliant thing is, most of these, a lot of these chaps can be named because of the artwork that we've just seen and other artworks and other collections. So, if you looked on the right hand side, that group there, at the, in the top set of three guys, the chap in the middle is Vazir Singh. The guy from the, the first, the portrait that we found in London. The Vindas portrait, that's him, worked up, placed and positioned in that scene. The next row down, the three chaps there, are the mirror image of the ones you've seen from the V&A. Now, what's brilliant about this is the chap opposite the guys in the middle, the one on the left wearing that um, uh, plaid shawl, red lined, he's a very famous Sikh leader called Jassa Singh Ram Gariya. His son is shown further below in the blue turban, Bir Singh. There's a portrait of them sitting in the National Museum in New Delhi. It's marked up, it's, it's been well studied. So, what you've got is this artist who's created a scene based on these individual proprietary sketches, which is what they do and they depicted an actual historic event, a coming together of these two parties to take on a third party. And these guys, these guys are the guerrilla the the leaders who are fighting the Afghans. They're up in the hills, the Afghans are still floating around in the, in the, in the Punjab. Well, they, these are to, the, be colored, yeah. uh, to, be, to be marked up as second generation Sikh king. Right. So the chap I mentioned, Maha Singh, the middle row on the right, that's Ranjit Singh's father. Right. right? They're the second generation, these are the guys who just fight, when there's no one else to fight with, they fight amongst themselves. Mm. Okay. And it's the Sikh way, the Sikh tradition. And again, to put this in, in, the, um, in, in, in context, so the Purku is this incredibly talented artist who previously had been working for the, uh, the Raja of Gula, San, Sansar Chand. Uh, and when Sansar Chand um, is, is outmaneuvered by Ranjit Singh, um, they, uh, uh, another of the, the Sikh leaders uh, Desa Singh Majitya, who's incidentally my landlady's great 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 grandfather um, <laughs> in Delhi. Um, I, just, he, I, just, I just found a miniature of, of him actually. Yeah, 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 I, I'll send me a picture and I'll yeah. get a discount on my rent next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, um, uh, he takes over Kangra Fort. And this is another example of, of, of the Sikhs having this great sort of stroke of luck that the, the land they're conquering is full of these amazing artists. And mm. Purku is another of them. And, and Purku and his brothers, some of them go down to Lahore and begin working there. Mm. And we've got a letter um, from one of Purku's um, uh, family who go down to Lahore. And he sends up to the hills and asks his brothers to bring artistic materials down mm. from him to the court. So this is the beginning of this migration down to Lahore, where, where now in, in, in the next few slides we'll see this amazing uh, uh, outpouring of patronage mm. at the court of Ranjit Singh. Mm. Well, just to give you the, the context of the story here, so this is where we now get into Sikh history. We kind of track, jump onto that track. This, um, the battle that uh, came out of this meeting, uh, in that battle, the, uh, the other chap, Jai Singh of the Ghanaian Missile, mm. his son, Gurbak Singh, is killed. 
Jazz Singh is forlorn, he's lost, because that's his heir apparent, and he's kind of, that's it, I'm done with fighting. Mm. And then very astutely, Gurbakh Singh, the, his widow, a lady called Sadakor, who is one of those incredible characters in Sikh history, a woman who, who, who does more than most men can imagine in a hundred lifetimes. She plays an incredibly smart, makes an incredibly smart, smart maneuver. And she says to Maha Singh, your son, who's five years old, and his name is Ranjit Singh, right? And he was, he was probably really ugly at that time. He just suffered about a smallpox. Pop Mark, lost an eye, right? Not the best looking kid on the block. <laughs> she said, I've got a three-year-old daughter, Madhav Gaur. I Let's betroth them and let's bring, the, bring an alliance to bear on our, on our fortunes. And out of that alliance comes these two people. Yeah. So these are, these are um, portraits on, on ivory. Probably some of the earliest portraits um, on ivory. Um, and it shows a young Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who we can identify there because of his blind left eye, with his first wife, um, Rani Madhab Kaur, who was that young girl that Paramjit just mentioned. Um, interestingly, we, uh, the, when we first, when we were first finding that portrait of Rani Madhab Kaur, uh, in uh, just off Kensington Church Street. Mm. Literally. Yeah, yeah, just off Kensington Church down, Street. Down the and road from Bob Shop, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. And the, and the one on the left is the earliest image of Ranjit Singh. It's probably, it's probably yeah. one, of, one of the earliest. There's, there's a, probably the earliest is at the British Museum. It's a, it's a miniature which shows Ranjit Singh uh, with less of a beard, with uh, meeting Holkar Rao. Um, but the Maratha. Uh, yeah. sort of the Maratha chief who was on the run. And, this, is, this is certainly one of the earliest images of Ranjit Singh. But from a collecting perspective, just to... When I first saw the portrait of Rani Madhab I didn't know it was Rani Madhab And also, I can't read Persian. And it's inscribed in Persian mm -hmm. in the bottom. But by seeing photographs and other pictures, it was enough. And you don't have very long to decide. So it was enough at that moment to think, well, could, this, could, this, be, could this be somebody important? What do I do now? I need to make a decision. Do I buy this or not buy this? And... Um, and it was very, very fine. I'd, see, I'd seen enough ivory portraits at that time to know what was fine and what was not. And in the, and the inscription uh, reads, um, Rani Matab Gaur, and then, but, and on this occasion, it gives us the name of the artist, and it says, Ratan Singh Musafar, um, who's the artist. We don't know if he's a Sikh artist or a Hindu artist, but we have the name, which is very, very seldom seen, particularly in um, ivory portraits. Uh, and it goes to show that this was probably made for somebody very special at the time. The image of Ranjit Singh on the left um, actually came, was actually once in the uh, possession of Maharaja Dalip Singh, his son, and it's inscribed on the back in Dalip Singh's hand, and sadly you can't make out, you can kind of make out some of it, and he kind of says a portrait of my father, and he's got his signature, but you can't really make out much of the rest of it. So a bit of, bit of history. Um, so 1799, the grandson of Ahmed Shah Abdali finally withdraws from the Punjab. The Afghans have been beaten by the Sikhs. These guerrilla bands that we saw in the last uh, uh, picture, uh, they are now victorious. They now control the Punjab. And a young Sikh Raja from one of these bands offers to help the Afghans withdraw in safety. Um, and the, the Afghans have got their, their cannons stuck in the banks of the River Ravi in the mud. Uh, and so this guy rides up on the left. Uh, offers to help and quietly takes over Lahore afterwards. Uh, and this is how Ranjit Singh gets his, gets his hold on this previous Afghan-dominated city of Lahore. That's right. And, he, and, he's, and he's in yeah. a, a, a quite small, small pox, yeah. 19 left years eye, old. 19 years old. Um, and Dodgy very, eye. And very much guarded by yeah. his mother-in-law. Yeah. Yeah. Better than doing <laughs> A-level. <laughs> yeah. uh, just a quick, couple of quick points on the Rani Madhav Gaur um, image. She, um, she was actually met by... Uh, uh, a woman called Mrs. Anne Dean in 1809. She was coming, returning back from Hardwar with a whole group of Sikh chieftains from the Patiala Jean states south of the river Satluj. And that encounter represents probably the first between a Western woman and a Sikh. Right? In 1809, it was Mrs. Anne Dean, and she happens to be the grandmother of P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> <laughs> and that's coming in a new book that we're publishing <laughs> by Ellen Nesbitt about Western women and 200 years of Sikh, uh, Sikh encounters. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, and on the left, that portrait, when you start looking at it in detail, there's a wonderful um, uh, painting in the British Library of a Sikh horseman. Done, it's from a Skinner album, dispersed Skinner album. It's a you know, wonderful comparison to horse, and it's... Uh, uh, 1820s. 1814 is the date yeah. on there. Yeah, it's about that time. 
And you look at the artwork, the brush strokes and so on, there's a lot of similarities. So Skinner, James Skinner, who's a famous... Uh, half uh, Sikh, half, half Rajput. Half, half, half Scottish. Half Scottish. Half Scottish. Same, same, same difference. difference. Yeah. Same difference. <laughs> Whiskey drinking people, yes. yes. <laughs> um, who, who had an illustrious career in, uh, kind of in, in early British history, British Empire history. Um, uh, and so there's, a, there's an important point that at that time when Rajit Singh is dressed in blue, he, this is probably when he was very close to acquiring the Kohinoor diamond at the height of his power, mm. basically, or on, about to just, just completely so, take off. The, so the Kohinoor uh, is in, in the possession of the Afghans at this point, mm. and the brother of the guy who's just um, withdrawn from Lahore mm. is this guy called Shah Shuja Umuk. Mm. Uh, and he's, he, oh, we've only got five minutes, better forget Shah Shuja Umuk, we'll go on to Randy. <laughs> 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 of course. Uh, and, and, yeah, talking about the Skinner album, here's one of those, uh, here, here's something that Skinner, James Skinner, uh, produced. It's an incredibly lavish manuscript that basically covers all of the Sikh and Rajput uh, rulers that yeah. he came across in the 1830s. There's only, there are only three of these uh, manuscripts known to exist. One's in the British Library, one's in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, and one is with Mr. Thule here uh, in his collection. And here, on the, that's the uh, opening folio on the left, incredibly uh, lavish gilt and so on. It's in Persian, yeah. and it gives a part of the history, yeah, it's a history of James' own Skinner's own writings on mm. the people he met and their yeah. histories. It's all like the a families of the Skinner produces two books at this period. One is, one is the Katofs, and he does the, all the local gentry, Sikh, Hindu, uh, Mughal. And then he does a companion book, which is in the British Library here, which is the ordinary people of Delhi. And so he does the opium sellers, the bird catchers, the sword makers. Mm. And, it's, and it's, they're sort of two companion pieces. Absolutely. But this is a very rare treasure and a wonderful, and it's complete. You're, you've got the whole album, haven't you? That's right, there. yeah. And you see, you Most of these are single leaves that we've been showing up to now, but this right. is actually a great big yeah. thing. Full of how many pictures? Together, I think it's about 30 miniatures. Yeah, I think no, it's a real treasure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is Ranjit Singh as he's coming near the end of his days on his throne. And this is uh, the probably contemporary portrait, but then you move into the next phase where you've got his successors and civil war and the collapse of the Sikh Empire that he was mm. responsible for building and, and, and managing. Mm. So you have this portrait of his heir apparent on the right, Maharaja Kadag Singh, uh, who is he's not, not quite, he's, like, he's a bit like the sort of Rahul Gandhi, isn't he? He's sort of, you know, he's sort of yeah. climbed from the... <laughs> exactly, exactly. There, 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 there's, there, yeah, there's a he's, he's, he's Maharaja by this point, right? So, he's so the he's, Maharaja by this yeah, point, yeah. So. And he is basically seen as a weak Maharaja, someone who, you know, the, 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 there's a big plot to... Kadak Singh is Karak a weak Singh, Maharaja, yeah. uh, and there's a plot to defend Unlike him. his brilliant dad, who... Yeah, just like, yeah. kind of set the scene of Ranjit Singh, 1799 to 1839, wonderful, prosperous time. This Maharaja's got this amazing respect from everybody all around. He employing died, Muslims, he, employing Hindus. Very, very cosmopolitan yeah. court, over 100 Europeans at his court. Very much... Ex-Napoleonic generals, all sorts. All sorts of in, people, yeah. and he's there... Keep it, happily, the British are keeping them as this sort of buffer state between India and Afghanistan. He dies, in and he's very good at playing the British off. He, he, yeah, yeah, very he, much. Yeah. They, they fear each other equally. But he, when he dies, within ten years, everything just collapses. Yeah, you know, there's as great a leader as he was. He didn't leave much of a succession plan. And part of the problem was Karak Singh, who was an idiot. Yeah. Uh, Emily Eden calls him a blockhead, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah, that's right. He's he's an opium <laughs> addict. He's actually. I mean, we saw Rani Madhab Gaur before Ranjit Singh's first wife. Um, you know, the accounts just say he wasn't, he wasn't in love with Rani Mathiapkor. They hardly ever were together. Uh, uh, he was, um, I think it was Raj Gaur, I think it was his, Karak Singh's mother, who was actually his second wife. So Karak Singh is, we know for sure, is Ranjit Singh's legitimate son, but he's his first child, but from his second wife. And, and that's who we see here on the right. And he, he looks very much similar to early portraits of Ranjit Singh. You know, you can, even in the portraits, you can see the, the resemblance. Yeah, and he, here he is seated on his golden, father's golden throne, which is now in the V&A, and he's sitting opposite his son, Nornihar Singh, who has a touch of the Ranjit Singh about him. So everyone's looking at Nornihar Singh. He's, this, he's a very uh, brave, he's been trained from early years to lead campaign, military campaigns, very shrewd, very adept, and he is far more of a, um, a ruler or a, a candidate for rule than Kadag Singh. So, but it doesn't end well. It doesn't end well because no. Nornihar Singh is uh, embroiled in a plot to poison his father, with arsenic and so on, and it's a slow death. Now, and horrible death. It's a slow, horrible death. Yeah. Um, on the day of Karak Singh's cremation in Lahore, Nornihar Singh is, re is, is, is returning to, he's going to a stream to just, you know, clean up a bit. And on the way, through a, an archway, 
Um, he is killed, almost mortally wounded, by falling masonry. It just happens to fall on his head the day. Just that day. <laughs> um, there's, 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 rumors abound that it's all a plot by Chief Minister Dian Singh and so on, and, and the, 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 the Dongra family. There's an account there. There's an account that there wasn't actually that much blood there at the time, but he's immediately rushed away, and when he comes back, he's really bloody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, all, yeah. it's all Game of Thrones on, yeah. on, yeah. on heat. And, and then it gets worse. Then we get Cher Singh. Then turn up. Then right. Here we are. Cher Singh's the guy you don't want to sit next to on the tube. He's the ultimate man spreader. <laughs> <laughs> and just. <laughs> He's this big guy, but he's got the corridor in his arm. So. You see this transition here. You, see, you, you know, we, we started off looking at sort of um, you know, images of Ranjit Singh. Ranjit Singh is very confident. He doesn't wear very many jewels. He's um, uh, he's a very kind of simple man. In in, in um, you know, when you see him in these portraits, and he's been painted by local Indian artists who don't often leave us their names. Then we find that the the Sikhs are being uh, painted by Europeans, and you have this painting, which is uh, August, by Schurft. August Schurft, a Hungarian. Um, traveller who, who visited the court of Lahore, he doesn't get to see Ranjit Singh. But in contrast to Ranjit Singh, what you see here at this time of real struggle for the throne is Sher Singh really asserting himself. You know, he's wearing almost every single jewel that you could get your hand on, um, amongst them the, the, the Kohinoor. But it doesn't end well for him either. No, it doesn't. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Do you want to tell um, the story? Well, um, I'll do it quickly. Well, I mean, so his, his two cousins come in and they say, look, Cher Singh, we've just got something that's special for you, a double barrel shotgun. Oh, whoops, it's gone off in your haste. And then, whoops, it's gone off a second time in your chest. So that's the end of Cher Singh. So you can now sit on the tube again after that. <laughs> what, what, what's wonderful here is that this is a work of art that's the patron is Cher Singh, and he's commissioned this Hungarian artist, Scherft. Um, but Scherft doesn't stop there when it comes to depicting Sikh art. He also produces this, and this is not what you... Well, not what many people would have called Sikh art a while back. Um, it's a scene that sh of, of uh, a group of thugs um, about to strangle an unsuspecting traveller. If you can see it here. Which used to belong to Ismail Merchant. Now, this is, yeah. Devinder acquired this in uh, Christie's in the Ishmael Merchant sale. Um, Ishmael, Ishmael Merchant, part of the Merchant Ivory duo, they produced a film called The Deceivers with Pierce Brosnan, Correct. Of, a, of an East Indian company officer who goes undercover to infiltrate a, um, a And Devinder posted on his wonderful Instagram account, which you should all follow, <laughs> a rather fetching portrait of the young Helena Bonham Carter sitting under this uh, portrait at the time of uh, Name of the Rose, not Name of the Rose, what's it? Uh, uh, a Room with a room view. The view. That's a room right. with the view. Now, now the reason why this constitutes Sikh art is because the victim is a Sikh warrior in the blue. Do you see him there? This chap here? He's one of the Nahangs, the sort of the, the crocodiles of the Sikh faith, right? Um, ferocious warriors, upholders of the, the teachings. Uh, now, you, there's a wonderful story. I won't tell it all now. It's in the book, and you have to get the book and get a <laughs> copy from Davinda, and then it'll unlock all its secrets. But the, basically, Scherft has done something rather remarkable in this painting. There's three or four layers of meaning for you to unpack in terms of who's, why did you put the victim there? Who's this chap sitting next to him here, and who's that chap sitting next to him there? And what's this woman doing with her fingers like that, and you know all that sort of stuff? So do take a good look at that. That's from, from a, from a, just to cook, we're running out of time now. We've got we? about five more minutes. Yeah. Have we? Yeah. Can I just, from a collecting perspective, can I just tell the story of this picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it because it began here, instantly, uh, interestingly. Um, uh, when I was probably in my sort of early teens, um, my brother, who's eight years older than me, um, came to the British Library with Bunji. Well, it was the India. Uh, Oriental and India office collection at Blackfriars across the bridge over. Where, where it was used to be and then yeah. it got moved here. It was an and old round chuckle building. That's right. And in those days, you know, this is nobody had any money. We were just looking for anything connected with Sikhs, any old images. And my brother um, pulls out this pile of books and Bandrit says to him, Don't worry about those. He said, I've already been through those. There's, there's no images of any Sikhs in those. And he said, Well, he said, I'm here now, so let me just have another. Let me double check. I'll have a look. He has a look, he flicks through this book and he finds a black and white engraving of a scene, very small black and white engraving of a scene, and in the middle of this scene he picks out this Nahang Agali Sikh warrior. And he calls you over and he says, look, look what I found here, and you can't... Probably, but probably, in my, my defence, it, it was a Victorian scrap album, and it was a portrait, <laughs> and they painted it sideways, so I didn't spot it for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you were embarrassed. And then, um, <laughs> and then, so he, he, uh, he finds... And, and the, it doesn't give an awful lot of information. <coughs> But it, it, it talks about you know, what the kind of scene is in this group of um, thugs. thugs. Uh, later, I can't remember how many years later, on eBay... Yeah, you came across... I, I was frantically searching on eBay for newspaper cuttings and all sorts, and I came across this group of papers which so showed a larger 
uh, black and white engraving of that same scene. Uh, but now, actually, the, the story attached to the painting and how it came about is in this newspaper article. And it gives us the information. It says that this is painted by uh, Auguste Schurft. And this is the scene. And this is this warrior who's been surrounded by these thugs. And that's it. Nobody at this point knows of the existence of the painting. All you're seeing is this black and white Miniature. engraving. Mm. Then we come across a book. What did you find that book, The Orientalist? I, I think I was searching, I'm doing a search on Google. Google Books has transformed everything for me personally. But there was a search, and, and Mildred Archer, who used to be at the V&A, yeah. um, she was reviewing and a book. And before that, in the, the Blackfriars. Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And she was reviewing a book by someone else, and she said, oh, this chap's misidentified this painting. Mm. And it was this painting that he'd reproduced in his book, and it was 1977. And, it's a, yeah. oh, it's a, you know, Holt at the Shrine of Ganesh is how, and it's by... A new, a new name, a new name for the picture. P.C. Lewis, before. or some, some artist. Yeah, it's and new, she goes, it's not, it's by Scherft. She knew. She knew. She knew, and then, but it did give us an insight as to where the picture, there now is the painting that you're seeing for the first time that these engravings have been made from, and it gives you an idea as to where, the where it is. Was, yeah. So then we find out where it is. Well, then the, the caption in the book, we come down to British Library, look at the book, and it says it's in the... Uh, James... The, the, um, uh, James Ivory collection? Yeah, no, James the Merchant. The Hart and Air. Is, uh, James Merchant. Merchant. James Merchant. Ishmael Merchant, James, oh, sorry, Ivory. James, James, Ivory, James Ivory. James Ivory, James Ivory collection in New York. James Ivory collection in New York. So now you finally find this picture, but we know the story from this old newspaper cutting. Get in touch with James Ivory, and uh, the academic in Barmjeet said, look, I'm going to give him all the information about the picture, and hopefully they'll let us publish this painting one day. The collector in me said, ask them if they want to sell it first. <laughs> 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 Having no money whatsoever. And anyway, we, we, they, they, we give them all the, all the information, and they're very grateful and allow... Uh, us to, to publish it <coughs> and, uh, and a few years on sadly Ishmael Merchant passes away and his collection comes up for sale and the star lot behind the auctioneer on stage is, is that painting and, uh, and so I finally we kind of found ourselves in this position we thought hang on a second this is done complete full circle maybe this is an opportunity to now, to can now I, buy it. Can I just ask the question I'm sure everyone is sitting on it you're, you're only 39 you, you didn't come from a wealthy background you've now got one of the, under your belt one of these great um, one of the greatest collections of art we've seen these succession of masterpieces I suspect everyone here is wondering how, how the hell did you do it where did all the money come from <laughs> See, normally, normally, I say, normally I should say my answer to this is drugs <laughs> um, <laughs> work for the East India no, company yeah. uh, the answer is drugs because I, I set up a pharmaceuticals company um, a number of years ago which, which, did, which did quite well um, but prior to that and, and the funny thing is is that people often ask that question and um, you know, I didn't inherit any collection, and and also going. If I, if I look back, I, I, I'm glad I didn't, and I'm glad I actually started off with sixty pounds and traded my way up, because through the process of collecting in that way, rather than having limitless funds and being able to buy what you want, was thousands of objects passed through my hands, and and, and many of them damaged, and needing restoration, and needing re research, and that there's no substitute. It's a bit like digging up houses and selling them. I mean, you're, you're buying stuff, doing it up. It on, yeah, it. yeah, partly, partly it was that, and partly it was the day job. So I'm an optometrist by profession, and partly I was trading in. And you know, when you when you get in, into involved in a world like this, you know, there's such an overlap. Very soon, you find yourself rush, learning about Persian art or Russian art or Ottoman art. Uh, even you know, I have found Crusader swords in the past in my hunt for Indian swords. You know, yeah. it's it's fascinating what you find along the way. And none of you have a, a specialist art historical training. You, you've taught yourselves entirely. Yeah. The, Happy amateurs. Yeah. <laughs> so any of you guys can do this. <laughs> All right, so I've got either happy to end there or just yeah, yeah, I think open, so it up to, open it up to the floor. Yeah. No, really. <laughs> Question here. Wait, 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 wait for a <coughs> mic. One other question, we'll have the second mic circle. Next one. The very first uh, slide that he showed, beautiful one, it showed the faces in, uh, in, in profile. And then gradually later, we began to see three-quarter faces. Now, was this a chronological thing? Because on the other hand, I'm going to argue against myself, that one of the last ones was back to a profile again. So was there an evolution, or was it just it came as it came? I think, um, generally, I think there is, there is an evolution. I think it's this... Um, the difference between the kind of European 
way of, of, of painting portraits and the Indian way of doing it. And you seldom see um, you know, full-on face-on shots in Indian images. In fact, when you do see them, they don't tend to be that good. And Indian portraits are, are mainly painted in pro profile. And it's very much about, not just about a kind of a real depiction of somebody, about a larger scene, about a narrative, a story, and a mood in, in an Indian picture. And then what we find as we went through this series, we find you know, Indian subjects being painted by Indian artists. Then you find um, uh, Indian subjects being painted by European artists. So then with like the Scherf portrait, you find, and even some of the ivory portraits profiles start to kind of appear. And at the same time, kind of photography starts to come about in India. In the early uh, high mobile period, uh, emperors are always shown profile, and less important people are shown three quarter profile. But that uh, sort of goes towards the 18th century and that, and yeah. that hierarchy. Yeah. There's another right. interesting thing about it. If you ever come across a miniature, um, try this little trick. Cover up, I mean, you see, the, uh, if they're three quarters, just cover up one half of the face and you notice that they've just made a portrait in profile and then added another bit on top. Yeah, it <laughs> doesn't work. And, and later on in, in company school art you see that develop even further because then what you have is local artists actually now painting for a European market and when they're painting for the European market you know the art you see the art change and you start to see paintings that, which are what we term more realistic I suppose in some ways. Last question here. Yeah. Hang on wait for the wait for the wait for the, oh, the mic. Back. There we go. I came in a little bit, a bit late, so I'm not sure if you already mentioned that. I'm just wondering, is it a kind of roving exhibition possibility in your works, or it stays...? No, no, no. I mean, uh, absolutely. It's, um, you know, I'd love to... As you know, Tutum Khan Muhammad moves all over the world, so surely... And I come from law, I come from Pakistan, so I'm just wondering if you come to I India, Pakistan... I think ultimately, <laughs> I think the value in it is it being shared. Uh, and uh, we've had some wonderful success with exhibitions here in London. We're looking at taking it to Canada. Uh, over the next couple of years to the, both first the, uh, the East Coast and then the West Coast and then over to America. And then but one day it would be wonderful if you can go to Pakistan and but, India. But Devinda, don't forget to mention that you can have your own personal exhibition <laughs> come for your own home. <laughs> and Thank very, you. very cheap. Very, <laughs> Thanks, William. Thank you very much. Thank you.